Welcome to Friendly Words, the sermon podcast of Pratt Friends Church in Pratt, Kansas. The message you're about to hear was originally preached at Pratt Friends Church on Sunday, May 9th, 2021. It focuses on Jesus' expansion of the kingdom to those outside the Jewish community. The message to all who will listen is Jesus is the Savior of all who put their faith in Him. Now, here is Pastor Mike Neifert. Well, let's pray together, and then we'll go to God's Word and hear what the Spirit has to say. God, thank you that you are here and that you are more than aware of all the needs that we have, and you are aware of the needs that people here have that they haven't told me anything about. And I pray that you would meet their needs according to your glorious riches in Christ Jesus, and that you might even meet the needs that they're not sure they want you to meet the need for correction and rebuking and conviction. And God, we thank you for the gift of conviction to your spirit because otherwise we would just go our own way and mess everything up. So God, correct us when we need it. And we pray now that you would accomplish your purposes through your word. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So a few weeks back, I talked about the one and only time I received a death threat in church league basketball. You remember that? Yeah, I mean, I stepped on the guy's toes multiple times, but still, you know, meet me in the parking lot's not quite the response I was expecting. When I was talking about that a few weeks ago, I also offhandedly mentioned that I wanted to, out of curiosity, try Death Wish Coffee. So guess what? Like just days after mentioning that I wanted to try Death Wish Coffee, which is billed as the world's strongest coffee, which may not appeal to some of you who like the nice frou-frou drinks with milk and sugar and all that kind of stuff, but I'm curious. And so just days after mentioning that in my sermon, I don't know if it was God or just happenstance, I went to the clearance aisle at Dylan's, and there was a box, 10 Keurig pods, of Death Wish Coffee for $7, which is way better than the $17 plus dollars it usually costs for that many. And so I picked it up. Now here's the only problem. I do not own a Keurig. So I was trying to figure out what in the world am I going to do? Because I don't have a Keurig, but I really want to try this coffee. And then I remembered that every Tuesday morning I meet with the pastors and they have a Keurig at the front porch where we meet. And so I thought, hey, if I share this coffee, I can try it. And so that's what I did. I took it with me to the front porch and we shared some of that. And I also gave a couple of pods away to people at the school and someone here in town. And my wife and I shared a cup. And so I got my wish to try Death Wish coffee. And I can tell you that it's pretty good. Tastes all right. Not sure I'm going to spend $17 plus dollars for it, but it was, it was good. And so here I was all over town, just like Oprah. You get coffee and you get coffee. Coffee all around. Now, obviously, I could have had more coffee if I had just snuck off by myself and not even told my wife about the purchase, you know, but that's kind of bad behavior. So what did I gain by sharing the coffee with other people? I gained happiness and shared experience, and they gained jitters and all that kind of stuff. (laughs) Generally speaking, good things are better when they're shared. Meals taste better when they're taken in with friends. Vacations feel more fun when family is along for the ride. Church is way more joy-filled when it's all of us together. About a year ago, for two and a half months, I was looking at this camera, and there was nobody on the other side. of. Well, occasionally there was somebody back there at the back. And then we were sitting in our living rooms watching it online together. Aren't you glad that we are back in the same room together? I mean, we've been doing this for a few months, but still, I just think back and I think, oh, this is so much better. Salvation is another got to share it thing, isn't it? Knowing heaven is going to be full of people who, like you and me, were sinful, broken messes before Jesus It just encourages me to know that we're going to be together in heaven, worshiping God together. 
And I'm looking forward to that. Heaven's going to be way better. Worshiping around God's throne with the redeemed from every tribe and nation and people. It's going to be way better. And I hope that even those who were once my worst enemies are there forgiven and rejoicing with me. Don't you? Because who wants anybody to go to hell? Ugh. God, make it so. May people come to know Jesus. All right, before I read this morning's first story out of our chapter in Matthew, and before I cry too much, uh, let's read a few verses from 2 Peter chapter 3. I want to make sure that the context is clear, so I'm going to read a little bit longer passage than I normally do in leading us toward our passage So I'm going to start at verse 3 and read through verse 15. Listen to what Peter says to the church. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. And by these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire being kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. Some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with this promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. We must never forget God's patience toward us. We would be lost forever if he was not long-suffering. Long-suffering for some of us. Without a bit of divine forbearance, we'd have missed grace entirely. Am I right? Yeah. God wanted you to be saved. He wanted me to be saved. And so he willingly tolerated sinful actions for a time so that you and I could turn away from them. That's the purpose of waiting is so that we could turn away from sin and to him and worship him and follow him as king. When you repented of sin, he joyfully forgave you. He had mercy on you. It pleased him to extend grace to you. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That's what it said in verse 9. Thanks be to God, he waited for me. May he wait a day or so more so that my neighbor and my friend and my enemy can repent. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, but not too quickly. Salvation shared is so much better than salvation alone. You get salvation. You get salvation. Salvation all around. That's the desire of God. Thus his patience. What is a thousand years to a timeless God? What's a thousand years if another generation can hear? What's a century or two if the good news can go to a people who haven't yet heard the name of Jesus? Back at Easter time, we watched those videos about the Evangelical Friends Mission goal to plant five new mission fields in the next five years and to have 10 new missionary families. And I remember Matt talking on those videos about how they would go on these trips, these Luke 10 trips, and find people who had never heard the name Jesus. I am so excited to be a part of a movement that's trying to chase down this goal and who takes it seriously that people need to hear the name of Jesus and need to come to faith in him. And so we're starting new fields. 
And we're going to stop right now, and we're going to pray about that. We need to keep that in front of us. We need to keep praying. So let's pray together. God, we thank you that we are part of your church and that Evangelical Friends Church in North America is working hard to to send out workers into the harvest field. And I pray, God, that you would do that. I pray that you'd help us to meet the goal because we can't do it. It's kingdom-sized and and it's too big for us unless your spirit does the work. And so we pray that right now you would prepare the hearts of those who are going to be sent and that you would send us to the right places, that we would find the places that you're ready to harvest, that you're ready to bring people to Christ. And God, we look forward to praising you and worshiping you in heaven forever and ever with people who don't yet know your son, Jesus. God, extend your grace. Extend your mercy. Amen? Amen. All right, we're almost ready to go on Matthew chapter 15, I promise. But there's one more thing I want to do first. I want to read the first words that God spoke to Abraham back when his name was still Abram. The very first words that we have recorded that he spoke to Abraham, who was the father of the Jewish nation before the man even had a single son when his heir was going to be somebody in his household that was a servant. The account of this encounter and God's first words to this man are found in Genesis chapter 12. I could read more, but I think just reading the first four verses will suffice. The thoughts important to today's message are found in this context. So here is Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 4. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out for Haran. The phrase which is key today is the last half sentence that God spoke. It's there in verse 3. It says, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Was God's blessing only for the Jewish people? Nope. It was for all peoples. It was always for all peoples. And it is still for all peoples. In the next few minutes, as we read from Matthew chapter 15, it's going to be really important that you remember this truth that we just heard from God's mouth, that the promise to bless is for all peoples. You got that truth locked in. Promise me you remember this the whole way through. We're not going to forget that as we move forward, that God's promise to bless is for all people. Let's read Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 to 28 now. This is a story that seems to contradict everything I just said. Jesus seems to act contrary to God's all peoples get blessed desire. You ready for this? This is a slightly uncomfortable story of Jesus and a foreign woman who comes and asks for healing. We're starting at verse 21. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. With all that's going on in this world and all the sensibilities that we have, does Jesus not sound racist? Was that an ethnic slur that we heard coming from his lips? If it is, is that a problem? Seems to me there's a problem. God promised to bless all peoples through Abram's descendants, and Jesus seems to be shutting this woman out, and he doesn't seem to be doing it very nicely. What do you do with this? 
Well, let's go through the conversation. We're going to start with the first words out of the woman's mouth and walk our way through this back and forth between her and Jesus to see if we can make sense of what seems to be a bizarre situation and Jesus acting out of character. What are her first words? Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, son of David is not a throwaway line here. It is a reference to the king to whom God had made a promise years earlier and a name which was connected to the predictions of a savior to come. To make sure we all understand, we're going to go to the Old Testament. Let's go way back in the Bible to 2 Samuel chapter 7. It's there that we find King David wanting to build a temple for God's glory and God responds to him through the prophet Nathan. Listen to what it says through Nathan in 2 Samuel 7, 11 through 16. He's already told David, no, you're not going to build the temple. And here's what it says. The Lord declares to you, verse 11, the Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed before me. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever." That last verse is key to understanding the name that the woman uses for Jesus in Matthew 15. She is acknowledging him as the king from David's line who will rule forever and ever and ever. She recognizes Jesus as the one whose throne is going to last. How does this Canaanite woman, a foreigner to God's covenant with Israel, know the promises he made to David? We're not told. But her use of the name Son of David indicates that she's ready to submit to the rightful ruler of all people. She's willing to recognize his power and his authority to grant mercy and to free her daughter from spiritual bondage. So that's the woman's first salvo in this back and forth. And Jesus shoots back with nothing. How does she respond to his silence? She keeps asking. We know this because the disciples start pestering Jesus about the pest who keeps crying out. Tell her to go away. She's bugging us. Sounds like kids in the back seat of a car. Jesus speaks to the woman finally. He tells her that he's only been sent to the people of Israel, but undeterred, she keeps pleading for her daughter's case, keeps saying, help us, help me. Isn't this how a mom would act? I am sure that my mom pestered God about me a few times. I know she did for my brothers. (laughs) They need some serious help. (laughs) And my sister. Moms, keep praying for your kids. Don't give up. Even if they're grown and out of the house and they're on their own, keep praying. Those kids that you reared and raised, they need help. They need mercy. Ask God to be gracious to them. All right, we're at the pinch point in this dialogue now. It's in verse 26 that we hear Jesus saying what sounds to us like a crazy bad ethnic slam. Did he really just call the woman a dog? That's a good way to get slapped some places. It looks like that's what he's doing, doesn't it? Jesus, the sinless son of God, did something, said something that you and I would not do. In fact, he just did something that our culture has called taboo. You don't get to do that. Now, does the fact that Jesus did this mean that you can go out shouting racist slurs at everybody that you walk around and see? I don't think that's a good application at all. I think that would be unwise to make that a matter of application. We are called to make peace, not to stir up anger, and we're called to draw people from every tribe, nation, people to Christ. We covered that earlier, right? So what is Jesus doing? 
Is he testing the woman's faith? Is he making a point with the use of what might have been a common phrase among the Jewish population when referring to those people over there? Don't know for sure. One thing is for sure. Matthew is not trying to make Jesus look bad. Let's remember that. He's holding Jesus out there, that he's the savior of the world, that he's come to draw people to himself. Matthew has been doing that all through this book. And why in the world in chapter 15 would he include this crazy story if Jesus was doing something wrong here? Throwing in this story cannot be an attempt to tarnish Jesus' image. What we see here can't be everything there is to see. It's likely that we're missing vital information because we didn't live back then in that culture. Listen, Jesus has already given healing at the request of a non-Jewish guy. Remember the story of the centurion who had his servant at home sick? And Jesus said, there's no one in Israel that I've seen as much faith as in this guy. So he's not against these people that are outside the Jewish community. The guy that he granted healing to before was likely a villain in a lot of people's eyes. I mean, he was the ruler of the occupying forces. Is it likely that Jesus is reversing course here? I don't think so. I tend to think, as Matt Whitman suggested in the 10-Minute Bible Hour, when he was talking about this story, that Jesus is using a bit of irony, or dare we say it, sarcasm, to help his disciples understand that the old barriers to the good news have been broken down. That the blessing that they thought was only for their people is for all people's. The woman gets what he's doing, it seems, and responds cleverly. Yeah, but even the dogs get crumbs that drop on the floor. Her words, both at the beginning, in acknowledging Jesus' place as king over all things, and her witty reply, show great faith in Jesus. And just as he's done time and time again in Israel, he heals the begging mom's daughter. Is God fulfilling his bless all peoples through you promise through Jesus? Here in the region of Tyre and Sidon where he and his disciples have gone to get away from the crowds and the persecuting religious leaders, Jesus performs a miracle for a heathen woman just like the healings that he's done for Jewish women in Israel proper. He is granting a foreigner all the good things that come by faith. The kingdom is for all who will submit to the king. That's how you get in the kingdom. You obey the king. You worship the king. It doesn't matter what your ethnic background, your cultural background is. All peoples in all times who put their faith in Jesus are welcome. Come on in. You ready for the next story? Matthew chapter 15, verses 29 to 39. Let's see what happens next. Jesus left there. So this is immediately after he's healed the woman. He left there and went along the Sea of Galilee. Then he went up on a mountainside and sat down. Great crowds came to him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and laid them at his feet, and he healed them. The people were amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled made well, the lame walking, the blind seen, and they praised the God of Israel. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry or they may collapse on the way. His disciples answered, where could we get enough bread in this remote place to feed such a crowd? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied, and a few small fish. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. Then he took the seven loaves and the fish, and when he had given thanks, He broke them and gave them to the disciples, and they in turn to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was 4,000 men besides women and children. After Jesus had sent the crowd away, he got into the boat and went to the vicinity of Magadan. Does it strike you as odd that Matthew tells the story of the feeding of the 4,000 so quickly on the heels of the story of the feeding of the 5,000? Why the repeat? I mean, we got his drift. We understood what he was trying to say after reading the first sack lunch narrative. Can God provide? Yes. Does he need to say it twice so that we get it? And what's with the disciples' cluelessness? They saw the 5,000 fed with a little more than a Lunchable. 
Where Jesus is and who he's healing matters here, I think. We're not told exactly where he is in Matthew, but Mark pinpoints the location of this miraculous event. So we're not going to read all of Mark's account, but I want you to understand where they are. And so I'm going to read just a single verse Out of Mark chapter 7, verse 31, this comes immediately on the heels of the story of the healing of this woman's daughter. So we know it's the same incident. And immediately after in Mark chapter 7, verse 31, then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. This verse comes before Mark in chapter 8 tells the same story that Matthew does in chapter 15 of the feeding of the 4,000. Having established the location in Mark, let me say this, the Decapolis is not in Israel. Jesus is among non-Jewish people. He's healing people who are not among the lost sheep of Israel, just as he did in the Jewish crowds. And he's feeding the pagan multitudes who have followed him out to this remote place outside the Decapolis with snack-sized provisions again, just as he did with the Jewish crowd a page or two before this. Matthew seems to be saying to chosen people and non-chosen people that the blessings which God promised to and through Abram, they're here. You get Jesus, and you get Jesus Jesus all around. This is the good news that we've been given to spread. I were to spread it pell-mell, just like the sower with the seed in that parable we looked at in Matthew 13. It goes everywhere so that God might produce fruit. We throw the news out here, and we throw the news out there, and watch it sprout in some people's lives and produce a harvest. The guys closest to Jesus, the men who saw him feed 5,000 Jewish men plus women and children, the men who saw him feed 4,000 non-Jewish men and the women and children that were with them, they took the good news everywhere. They saw thousands of Jewish people and thousands of non-Jewish folks get what God had promised years and years before, the blessing of salvation through faith in Jesus. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. We're back to Abraham. You and I have been saved by grace through faith in Jesus because God was faithful to his promise to Abraham, otherwise we'd be excluded. You'd be outside, not able to get in. But God never intended it to be just for the Jewish people. He chose the people so that he could bring the Savior to the world to save the world. Glory be to God. He has kept his word and all those who would have been called dogs. The dogs have become children, heirs, part of the kingdom. And we get all that's good directly from the table of the one who's patient, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to salvation. If you have not turned away from your selfish, sinful ways, if you haven't bowed your heart to the king, the King of Kings, the Son of David. I urge you to do so. Please believe on Jesus and trust him for salvation. There is no other way for anyone to be forgiven and set free from sin than that. Consider what you've heard today. Listen to God's voice as you still your heart. Do what you need to do with the word that's been implanted in your heart. Do you believe? Do you need to give thanks? Do you need to pray for a friend or a neighbor or an enemy who is far from God, who needs God's rescue? Do what God prompts you to do. Pray as he leads, and please, if you haven't put your faith in Christ, do it today. Trust him and follow him. I'm not inviting you to just pray a prayer. I'm inviting you to submit your life to him and to follow him. Let's pray. God, if you didn't have mercy on us, we would have no hope. We are desperately sinful and we do the wrong thing so often. The good we want to do, we don't do. The awful things we don't want to do, we do. 
but we have victory through Christ Jesus. And God, I pray that you would draw people to you. Someone hearing today that has not put their faith in Christ, I pray, God, that you would work in their heart to bring them to that place. That they would come to faith and receive by faith the righteousness of God, that they would be made right with you and that they could live in this kingdom and follow you and obey you as king. We thank you that you didn't withhold the bread from the dogs, but that you gave the good things of the kingdom to those who would put their faith in you. I thank you that you made us heirs of the kingdom, that you brought us into your family and called us children. Thank you for that. Now as we close, I'll read these words from 1 Timothy 1.17. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever for all he's done for drawing us into his kingdom. Amen. We hope you have been encouraged and challenged by today's sermon. If you want to hear each week's message, be sure to subscribe to Friendly Words in your podcast app. May God bless you as you follow Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit.